Bienvenue et au, au série de séminaires de R2MP. Aujourd'hui, ça me fait plaisir de présenter eh, eh, le conférencier Cher, Serge Charlebois. Eh, Serge est eh, eh, professeur titulaire au département de génie électrique à l'Université de Sherbrooke. Et quand on regarde le parcours de Serge, une chose qui est frappante, c'est la diversité de la thématique de recherche qu'il a abordée eh, eh, au cours des années. Euh, par exemple, au doctorat, il a travaillé, il a fait un doctorat en physique eh, dans le sujet des pétroles quantiques dans les hétérostructures et semi-conductrices. Puis, il a fait un postdoctorat, un stage postdoctoral à l'université de Charners et en Suède, sur Suède, où il a travaillé sur l'application des circuits ou la nanofabrication des circuits supraconducteurs pour des applications dans l'informatique quantique. Et plus récemment, il s'intéressait au problème des, des expériences et l'instrumentation et pour les expériences en astrophysique, et en astroparticules, en partie en collaboration avec l'Institut de, de McDonald. Et mm -hmm. Donc, c'est ça le sujet il va, il va, dont il va nous parler aujourd'hui. Donc, merci Serge et, et désolé pour le pour les retard. Oh, ça arrive. <rire> euh, ça, j'arrive à comprendre. Et en fait, quand j'organise quelque chose, des fois, ça finit comme ça. Donc, <rire> euh, oui, mais ça, c'est de son côté. Oui, parfait. Donc, euh, euh, merci à tous ceux et celles qui sont dans la salle. Euh, merci pour l'invitation. Um, so, thanks to everyone that is present here and all those uh, yeah, 15-ish other people online elsewhere in Quebec, I presume. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to, to present you, yes, my kind of new field of expertise that I've been developing since uh, uh, 2015, 16, uh, even a bit, uh, a bit earlier than that. So, and, and RQMP is a, is a group looking at solid state physics, uh, device physics and sciences such as that. So it is kind of strange to have you know, astroparticle physics as a first title. Um, but it really is an emphasis on instrumentation that I want to, that, that I will try to bring you into that. I find this uh, quite fascinating and maybe I can remove the mask. Eh? Oui, oui. <laughs> Thinking out loud. Um, yeah, so, so it's, it's the instrumentation of large scale experiments that presents very, very interesting technical challenges, but also uh, fundamental challenges where we have to improve the technology continuously. I've been involved in industrial projects in which, uh, besides that, or prior to that, in which you also have to develop a lot of things, but in an industrial problem project, the cost is a major issue. I'm not gonna say that these experiments don't have cost issues. They cost millions, but, the goal is so pristine, is so high that it has to provide, it needs the new technologies. And, and that's kind of, uh, that's a very nice context in which uh, we can, as solid state physicists, device physicists, uh, exer exercise our expertise. So that was the, the long title introduction. Um, there is also, uh, a long, long introduction that I should do on, on the very broad collaborations that we have to accomplish this. At Université de Sherbrooke, we have a few, we have many colleagues that, that contribute to, to our work. When I say our work, I should have mentioned uh, first, I should mention first Jean-François Pat. So we are the two leaders of this uh, activity in astroparticles. Recently, uh, two new professors have joined, Audrey Corbeil-Terrien, Marc-André Tétro, have joined this effort. And it stems from past work on PET imaging with Jean Fontaine and Roger Leclerc. So, so it, it's, uh, it's a rather new subfield, but we've been involved, Sherbrooke has been involved in, in radiation instrumentation, well, not since the beginning of time, but you know, quite quite long ago. So, uh, and the rest of uh, the rest who actually do the work are the students that were there uh, along the way, and many collaborators from uh, Triumph, 
from Carleton uh, and other universities uh, doing particle physics. So the outline of the presentation will be, will go quite rapidly uh, on, on the Nexo experiment and the dark side experiments showing what is actually uh, the goal, uh, wh what is the trend right now in astroparticle physics uh, research. And then we'll make the shift towards the technology development that is being done at Sherbrooke and in their wedge where physics and, and uh, original physical uh, physics contribution come into play. And uh, I will certainly not be able to describe the spin-offs of that in medical imaging and quantum information, but, but it does, uh, I have slides, but it will probably uh, slip over. So the EXO experiment is uh, the search for neutrino-less double beta decay in uh, the uh, xenon isotope 136. It's an international collaboration, Sherbrooke's on there, um, uh, to, to build an experiment that would be located in Snow Lab. Um, but before going to neutrino less double beta decay, let's just review uh, what simple <laughs> beta decay is. So it's a process by which a, um, a neutron is changed into a proton, leaving an electron out there, that's the beta uh, in, in the beta decay, and an anti-neutrino. So the uh, archetype example is lithium to beryllium, and uh, yeah, that's it. When you look at beta decay, you have a conservation law, which is the lepton number conservation law. Essentially, lepton number conservation counts the number of uh, leptons and anti-leptons, and this should balance off to zero. That's, that's the way it works. So in simple beta decay, these are the equations there. Um, in 36, uh, Goepemeyer showed that it was possible, I, I believe, uh, unfortunately, I forgot to check. I think it's a, it's a theory paper at that time. But uh, she proposed uh, that double beta decay could happen. So a, co a coherent uh, decay uh, transforming two neutrons into two protons, two beta, and, oh, it, it does things, and two uh, anti-neutrinos there. So when you look at lepton conservation, then you get, um, then you get uh, still zero because the, the because uh, the, the number of particles and entire particles do match. When you look at neutrinos, neutrino less double beta decay, what happens is if, so it's kind of presented the other way, but if the, the neutrinos are not just standard fermions, but if they were Majorana fermions, then they would be, one of that property is that they are their own antiparticle. So they could cancel out. So there could be a process in which two neutrinos are, two anti-neutrinos are emitted, but there could also be a process in which no neutrino gets out of there because coherently they just, you know, the, uh, they never come out of the reaction if I can crudely say like that. Um, so in that case, if this can be observed, first of all, it would be uh, the only or the first lepton number conservation uh, failure law failure because there's there's not this uh, the zero here there's no neutrino to counterbalance uh, uh, leptons and it, so it would show a possibility that these are Majorana uh, fermions but there are also other ideas that could lead to that this is this being the the prominent the prominent theory so this would be a, a major game changer the the recent physics nobel prices turned you know were around recent 50, 2015 was around neutrino oscillation and this would kind of break the standard model and offer a path towards new discovery so how do you observe it how do we get rid of the what the because uh, when I touch the screen, it, it writes on it. Um, so, so, so how do you see that? How do you see these, uh, these events? Well, if you look at um, so the, the probability of these events, double beta, uh, 
double beta uh, with neutrinos or without neutrinos, when you look at the probability, these are, are the, the no neutrino, if it was true, would be still very faint. And it is very interesting to compare the lifetimes of these events. So the, the, the two neutrino double beta decay, which has been measured in the, uh, the, uh, the previous experiment, exo experiment, showed something like 10 to the 21 year uh, as a lifetime. Now recall that, you know, the universe is only 10 to the nine years. So, so this, this is significantly much longer than the lifetime of the universe. And if we go to the neutrino less double beta decay, then we have something presently tested to more than that and emphasize on the more. So it is a rather complicated challenge to, to, to show this. How do we do that? Well, we make use of, um, we make use of the Avogadro, Avogadro number. So instead of you know, holding one xenon atom and waiting for 10 to the 28 years, then you hold 10 to the 28 atoms in a container and you look for the complete signal and then you get maybe a year to wait to get that signal. So that's parallel computing, <laughs> parallel experimenting on the, the molecular side. So this is, uh, these are the numbers that you can compute uh, uh, to figure out that uh, to presently, if you put the numbers in there, presently for 10 years of operation, we would count, we expect to count 20 beeps in the experiment that would be linked to neutrino less double beta decay. So this is a rather rare event. And if you look at, uh, recall here that there was a big lump for the double beta with neutrinos. If you look at the double beta rate, then you have about five, five decays per minute of the double beta decay with neutrinos. That, that is inevitable from looking at a large volume of xenon uh, atoms. So this is a very big challenge. And if you add to that, you know, a banana decays with beta decay, uh, positron emission uh, 10 times per second, a bicycle is 0.3 decays per second. If you add that, you know, measuring 20 events in 10 years is a complicated feat. Yep. So what if you have like more xenon? Like you said, you put five tons, or what if you have like 50 tons? Is it not possible? Yeah, it is. It, it is possible. So I'm going to skip exactly. I wanted to skip the sensitivity talk. We, we can come back to that. But in this field, people put lines. You see, I'm, I'm kind of entering that field. So I talk about them and I. So um, they put a line. And above that, we know it's not there. And we're trying to get as low as possible in almost all these diagrams, like giving you keys for the reading of these things. Um, so to your question, uh, can we not increase the volume? Yeah, that's the key. So first experiment was done on five kilo. Uh, I don't recall what, what sensitivity that brings. The, the latest was done on 150 kilo. It's called 200 kilo, but it's effectively 120. And now we're aiming for 5,000. So five tons of, of xenon. And what we show in, in, this, uh, in this graph, very, very crude cartoon, is the efficiency of increasing mass and therefore money involved in the experiment, okay? Um, and that's shown by the attenuation length, this little bar here, these are all the same length. And when you compare it to the volume, so any radiation, the most problematic radiations that come in the experiment would be 2.5 mega electron volt gamma that we probably could not distinguish. Well, they do not penetrate deep in very deep experiment, in very large experiment, so that the effective functional uh, volume is really, really large. And, and so it's kind of self-shielding. So this is one of the main, it's nice that to understand that one of the main driver for large experiment is that very, very simple argument that the larger and the less stuff there is you put inside uh, as material, metals, or things like that, then you have the purest environment to look at. So that's the, uh, oui, André-Marie. So, but uh, 
the neutrinos are hard to detect, right? So yeah. So that's a big problem. How do you know there are neutrinos left? So when you look at the energy diagram, when there are neutrinos, then you have a four particle coming out, four particles coming out of the decay. So you have to match the momentum sharing of these things. So it gives you the beta particles have this large distribution in energy. But a bit like positron emission, uh, positron uh, uh, electron, electron. annihilation, uh, because there's nothing coming out but, a pho but two photons, and, and the, the conservation law imposes, they, they go aside. So the energy is very narrow. And the energy is very, very well known, known to like three positions after the dot, like six significant six digits, just because we know the mass of the uh, of the atoms in, in question. So, so the the, the in, in this experiment, that's the the good thing. We know exactly where to look. So that's one type of experiment. So this uh, and I'll, I'll go a bit more in in details later, but. The whole idea of the experiment is to put that liquid uh, xenon inside a, a cryost inside a, a TPC time protection chamber here, where the experiment will be in in a in, a, in an oil a cryogenic oil environment, a vacuum shroud in a large uh, pool of water to uh, to measure all the other radiations and rule out. So how this kind of thing works is when you look, when we talk about 10 years of exposure, actually you have to accumulate the years of exposure, but remove the time you have to cancel out the measurement because some radiation came in from, from muons from space. So that's why two things, you have this large pool around that you look at scintillation and that's why you put it at Snow Lab in Sudbury, because this is the, the deepest uh, laboratory in the, in, on the planet. So that's where these things are, are meant to, to, be, uh, to be installed. So uh, neutrino-less double beta decay is looking for a signal at, at a very specific energy. Whereas in dark matter, this is, an, uh, it's another approach, it's another challenge. Um, so dark matter, we know it exists from many things and I'm not go, <laughs> gonna go on, on these because I'm, I would just you know, be a level of science et vie on, on, that, uh, on these explanations. But we're looking for at least 27% of the mass that we can observe. Um, so that's missing. Um, on this uh, field, uh, in xenon, there are two to three competing experiments for neutrinoless uh, double beta decay. In, in argon for dark matter, there's an international collaboration which has this very cryptic name there. And you have a sequence of uh, large experiments. This is running at uh, Snow Lab presently. Um, this was a, a predecessor of that. These are large volume of argon, and you're trying to look at a signal in argon. And again, size does make a big difference. So presently, we are, uh, Jean-François and I are part of, uh, and Audrey uh, corbeil terrier we're part of DarkSide 20K, an experiment being built in Italy uh, for 20 tons of, with 20 tons of, of argon, looking at 20 tons of argon. And the next step, and that's why the international collaboration is there, is aiming at 3,000 tons of, uh, of, of tons, years of fiducial. So 300 tons, 400 tons of argon in Sudbury. And in Sudbury, because it's, it's the only place on the planet it should be because it's the deepest. These require large holes in the earth. Okay, so these are very big challenges and it's thought to be, you know, operating in the 2030s. People in this field are very patient. <laughs> uh, so looking at how this happens. Um, so we're in this experiment, we're looking at WIMPs, uh, which are uh, weak interacting massive particles. And because the, the earth uh, moves around the galaxy, probably wimps also move, but there's globally a wimp wind uh, crossing the earth 
And some of these WIMP that never or very rarely interact with real ma normal matter, will, we're hoping that they will hit a uh, argon nucleus and then generate a signal that we can analyze. So uh, this is an elastic collision. So here we have a, a broad spectrum of, of energy that we want to look at from 20 to 200 kilo electron volt. I didn't say how Nexo was working, but it's similar in the sense that once the event happens, there will be scintillation and the ionization of the argon. And in the TPC, you put a large, in the time projection table, you put a large field, so you get a, a and photo detector. So you get the light signal at the speed of light. And with the field, you drift the electrons and you get a second signal for that. And that allows you to position the event and, and do the physics around that, count the energy and things like that. Um, I'm going to skip the, uh, the sensitivity, uh, uh, the, the exclusion uh, talk slide. I'm going to go briefly, I meant. So you have here the area that we know no uh, dark matter has been seen above there. Presently, the experiments are trying to reach these levels here. And um, uh, with the dark side, we're trying to reach the red level around there. And I really appreciate your mouse there. It's, the mouse is not me. It's not my finger. It's an intermediate. Uh, and with Argo, we're trying to put it down there. But that's my sketch. But it was just about like that on two complicated graphs that I want. So, so the whole idea of this field is, it, again, is essentially increasing the volume to reach where, you know, then, then it would be difficult to, to see for other reasons. Um, yeah. So I was uh, so I was ex uh, was explaining to you the the signals we see. So we see uh, when when there is a, a decay event like in Nexo or a, a dark matter interaction, you will get energy deposited. Lots of photons will come out. If you count the photons, then you know how many, much energy has been deposited at that site. So that's one way. Um, but you have to also count the electrons because, because those were non-photon emission, okay? That was a dark signal. So you get, you drift them to the top and when they reach the top phase of the argon, they, they luminesce or you can measure them electrically and you count these electrons. So the total charge uh, amount of, of secondary particle that were generated by the decay event gives you the, a measure of the energy. Um, and, and here's the, an illustration of, of the, um, the dark side 20K experiment. So the volume of interest is here. The whole cryostat, which is almost two times the volume will be filled with argon. I think it will, so it's 20 tons in the functional volume, but the total would be 50 tons of cryogenic liquid. And in this case, it has to be in xenon, Experiment in, in the Nexo experiment, you want xenon 136. So you enrich to get that one essentially. In this case, you go the other way. Argon 39 will give you a signal that will blind you to uh, dark matter. So you want to deplete it. So I didn't put it, but in, in Sardinia, there is a large distillator, uh, high as like the, the Tour Eiffel and in a mine shaft and they literally distill argon to get you know to the level needed to deplete it from the back main background source so i've hinted you to the need to counting photons um, the energy uh, in these experiments is is measured by counting the photons emitted by a first signals first signal Drifting electrons to uh, to the other to another detector, which sometimes measures a second light beam or just the electrons. Uh, in Sherbrooke, we are focusing on instrumentation of the photon counting devices. Uh, so the rest is not important. No, no, it's essential for the experiment, but other groups do that within the collaborations. So how do you count photons? Well. You know, solid state presently, the, the previous experiments were using 
the photomultiplier tubes. Uh, bulky stuff, bulky things that you cannot cryogenic. Well, you could cool them, but if you put them too cool, actually they lose efficiency. So there's there was a, a large challenge in building or previous experiments due to that. The trend now, all these new new experiments will put the photodetector semiconductor, the photodiodes, right in the cryogenic liquid. Uh, performances are actually somewhat better at, at those temperatures. And when I say cryogenic, I'm not saying, you know, milli Kelvin, it, it really is really warm, you know, um, minus 108 degrees Celsius and, uh, or, or 90 K uh, for argon. So it really is, uh, really is warm. That's, uh, these are IV curves of uh, photodiode. So you have the direct mode in which you don't normally do any photodioding. Uh, there's the reverse uh, linear region. There's the avalanche region where you get some gain on your signal. And what I want to talk to you about is the Geiger mode in which we use the diodes in our case. Geiger mode uses them past the breakdown. So yet another bachelor exercise, um, saturation current. So this current, here in the reversed regime. If you count, if you, if, you, if you calculate the saturation regime from the Shockley's equation, you get, you know, 10 to the 19, I, I've put some numbers here. You get 10 to the 19, uh, 10 to the minus 19 amps for, for a photodiode. So that's really no current. If you look into what an ampere is, and you want to see it as a rate of passing electrons, then what you see is that there's only one electron passing the diode every 30 milliseconds, 300 milliseconds. 300 milliseconds, that's one second, you know, roughly. So, so it's a really rare event. Um, but that's not the main contribution in, in, in diodes, especially in silicon. It would be a depletion zone contributions. If you put these numbers, then you get to a more realistic 10 to minus 15 amps. That's a very, very, that would be a very, very good diode. And there you have, you know, 100 microseconds between each electron. But the point in this is that it's not a continuous, it is a, it depends, it's a matter of scale. It's not a continuous flow of electrons. Electrons go at a very, with a very long pause in between. So what we do with a photodiode in the Geiger mode is that this line here, I have Denis Maurice here. Denis Maurice taught me uh, semiconductor physics, but he was wrong, okay? This line here is only the average behavior. This line is when you look at it macroscopically on large time scales. If you are able to polarize your diode to the, the point A here, it will stay to that no current, too much voltage position for a long 100 microseconds in the very good, uh, in the very good photodiodes. Then an electron will come, we'll see this crazy field inside and will just trigger an avalanche. The device will then jump onto what the Nimonis told me, you know, an IV curve. And at that point, if, if you leave it there, well, it probably will burn out. So, so you have to have a, a feedback mechanism that brings the, the, photo, the biasing point to point C. And, and then you, so, so what you get is a bleep in the current with, with self-quenching. Uh, self, uh, uh, that's why it's called Geiger mode, because this is typically what happens in a Geiger counter, gas Geiger counter. So you have a, an avalanche, but the avalanche quenches itself through, through mechanisms uh, that are not similar to that. So when you want to operate a, a photodiode, we call it single, photo, uh, single photon avalanche diode, you need a quenching, cis, uh, quenching circuit. And that circuit can be very, very simple, like a resistor. When the photodiode fires, there's a large current going through it. So if you put, I don't know, 20 volts here, uh, a few volts above the breakdown, then the current will generate a, a voltage around the resistor, stealing 
bias to the diet and self-quenching the diet. So there's, there's a choice of values here that you have to arrange, but this is the very, very strong trend in, in photon counting device. It's called a silicon photomultiplier. It gives a signal very, very similar to a PMT, to a photomultiplier two. It's a solid state device. It's an array of photodiodes. The squares here are the photodiodes. It's an array of photodiodes and uh, in parallel. So when one fires, the other ones stay active and it, one resets itself and, and, and so on for, for every photon. So you, you, if you look at an oscilloscope, then you will see various levels of, of current voltage, whatever, how you, you measure it. And these levels help you quantify the number of photons. So there were one, two, three, four, five photons in the device. Um, of course, now I'm talking about photons because I'm interested in counting photons. But on the slide before, I told you suddenly there's a, an electron going through the diode. And these two events, Either the diode triggers by a photon, what you're interested in, or a spurious electron going through the, the reverse bias uh, current, you cannot distinguish the two. So you have to, noise just takes another form in these device. Uh, instead of a level of noise, uh, instead of a level current, what you get is a, a count, a dark count rate. Um, so that's what, uh, that, what, that's what is, done presently. And what the, the way Sherbrooke, uh, uh, well, we didn't invent anything in digital SIPMs. Actually, the first SPADs were the, the yeah, this, the first, this principle of Guy Gamot was actually almost done uh, with electronic circuit at the beginning in, in the 80s, uh, 90s. Um, in our case, what we do is we interface each diode with a CMOS electronic circuit uh, instead of just a resistor. And through that transition, so we, this, this uh, electronic circuit allows us to see and count and, and transform the current signal you would get in an analog SIPM into a, a digital bit zero or one. And then you have a digital readout electronic thing. In the conventional way, you have an analog device. So we have to read it with uh, analog to digital conversion. You have to transform that into a, a, a you have to measure it, okay? Now, what is sad about this is that the device here, the diode itself in Geiger mode is either not fired or fired. The information is intrinsically binary. But because we add them as a current analog uh, in an analog way, then you have to spend a lot of energy for an ADC to measure it back. Here we shift the burden. So we put CMOS electronics right after the diode. That's the complication. But then once you can do that, then the measurement is trivial. Obviously not trivial, but then there is no noise into that. There is no, there's less energy into that. So what we've been developing for the last, uh, well, more than 10 years now with Jean-Francois is the concept of photon to digital converter. So we have the analog to digital converter. Here we convert photons directly into, uh, into a digital signal. So we, we have the benefits of photon to bit conversion at the center. So there's, at the sensor, so there's, there's no noise added there. There's intrinsic noise. Sometimes the SPAD just triggers by itself through thermal process or other traps and things like that. But, but there's no analog noise in that. Uh, so these are bits. Uh, the single photon counting, uh, you can do it over the whole range, dynamic range, because there's no fluctuation. Uh, when you sum analog uh, ana in an analog way all the, the, the diodes in an array, then you get variations and you smear out the response. Here, you add zeros and ones. So there's no error in that conversion. And because um, we don't use the, uh, because we don't use an, an ADC and because the system is just waiting for a photodiode to trigger, all that long waiting time it requires no power. 
that's the strength of CMOS or, or very less power, much less power. But the problem is that if you want to do that, you will either have to put a small photodiode with a lot of CMOS around or a large photodiode with crude CMOS with barely all the functionalities you would like to have. So uh, this is th this idea is is very trend has been very trendy in in all in our all, all our cell phones. Uh, the cameras are made of multi layers uh, uh, chips, one for the detectors and signal processing right under. So we we did not invent uh, the wheel on this, but what we decided uh, on, on the leadership of Jean Francois had to do was to work at vertically integrating the photodiode above the CMOS so that you get the largest photodiode and all the electronic space you can have. So that's a challenge though. Um, but we were fortunate to have the, the strength of astroparticle physics with the interest of developing such a technology for large scale experiments. So we've been funded in ways I would not have expected in my career. So this is really cool when it hits you. Um, and this allows us to literally work at making these device wafer levels in the foundry in Broma. So photodiodes are designed by our team um, in Sherbrooke with the help of, of uh, Bromont, who are a CCD, world-class CCD fab. So they know how to do photodiodes. We, we, were, we uh, learned a lot on that. There's another layer, which is the CMOS electronics, which is done in Sherbrooke. That, that's really the trades of Jean-Francois. Um, at wafer level, uh, soon we will order full wafers of our products. I do not know many academics allowed to do that in their career. This is really exciting. And we've been developing the process for gluing and contacting those two uh, wafers together. And here are just pictures of how we do that with an aluminum germanium eutectic bonding. So again, I wanted to emphasize the fact that uh, through the, the very strong need of new technologies for astroparticle physics, we were able to push these innovations in a way uh, uh, yeah, this happens in only once in a career. So, so, so this is what we're doing in, in Sherbrooke. <coughs> and we've, uh, we've proceeded quite, uh, we, we it, it goes well, <laughs> that's what I meant. So here's a picture of uh, among the first uh, SPAD wafers that we've received on the, on the top left. Uh, a micrograph of uh, an array of spads here. And here you see details of the various uh, variations of spad that, that's bottom center. So with different sizes and, and, and arrangement of doping and, and guard rings and things like that. So we have to, to build that knowledge. Uh, and, and that's what our team is doing. Here's a the same thing, but you see a cross section where you see isolation trenches on the side. It's a rather complicated process to fabricate. Um, because they are spans meant for being quenched with CMOS, if you want to test what you've done, you can if you don't have CMOS. But CMOS only comes at the end when you assemble everything. So, you know, we had to find other ways. So, to do the SPAD optimization, you have to also develop readout systems. So here we have a CMOS dedicated for just the development of the SPADs, where we wire the SPADs here on multi-channel, and we can test many of those. So here's a, a so in, in this case, this is a small board about, uh, yeah, a few inches, square inches. And they're, they're connected through wire bonds. You would never do a system like that, but this is functional. It measures light and it allows us to, <laughs> to show very good properties. So photon sensitivity, which is centered around 400 uh, nanometers, so visible, well, uh, bluish visible. That's a very nice uh, wavelength for, for uh, PET imaging and um, 
and some of the argon experiment versions. Because there are single spans, very small spans, you get a very, very precise, very high timing uh, capability. So the, the, the time it takes for the span to trigger is actually rather uniform. That's a translation of what I just said. Um, the spurious phenomena. So when you cool down the photodiode, you see that the dark noise, when you don't uh, put any light, is actually uh, decreasing uh, following a, an Arrhenius law and with the proper slope. So that, that was a, one of the first telltales that we were doing very, uh, a very good job with the photodiodes. And although, although the, the, the noise level is too high, it's stopped here. So if you want to know this, at this level, it's, uh, it's band to band tunneling. So, so the, the, the thermal channel is, is shut but when you cool down, but at a point you still have a high field and you have a band to band tunneling of electrons into the valence band and uh, triggering an avalanche. So we have this floor that we had to cure, but we're not very far and the slope shows us that, that we can reach the floor needed for uh, the Nexo experiment, the low dark noise signals that we need for these experiments. Um, and we've developed all the characterization methods for doing that on a digital process. One of the, one of the paper I'm quite proud of is, is from uh, my student, Frédéric Vachon, who developed, because we adapted the analog way of looking at the device as to what a digital signal can, can do and can do better because there's less noise on it. So this is a very in, interesting uh, field of work. Uh, the, la the last challenge we're trying to tackle not exactly the last. The, the, the other challenge we're trying to tackle with, uh, with the photodiode is, um, is that uh, we need to measure the v, uh, a VUV signal from xenon. The light emission from xenon and argon is either 175 nanometer or 125 nanometer. And the problem is penetration of these wavelengths is you know few nanometers. So the problem of measuring that in silicon is that you get uh, you, you, all materials, most materials are, are absorbent uh, and silicon is strongly absorbent, but it's so absorbent at the surface that you actually, um, there is, uh, don't look at the red line, but there uh, uh, at the center graph, but there is a trap on, on the surface and that trap actually holds all the electrons and the detector comes blind, becomes blind to that high energy uh, photon. So it's, uh, it's sad, but it has been shown in the past for CCD, uh, uh, astronomy CCDs, that you can correct that by delta doping. And this is done through a, a Arthur McDonald Institute collaboration with the Berkeley National Lab. So we have our devices being processed there to increase the sensitivity. This would be a very, very big screen game changer in some of these ex physics experiments because we would get a better signal faster and uh, make it easier for the, the discrimination of background and things like that. Um, I was telling you these, all the characterization is done at home, even using uh, on board, you know, you see you have a normal probing needle, but here you have an active PCB that actually carries the, the CMOS uh, readout. Um, the electronics under, so I focused more on the SPAD. Uh, I think this community is nearer to the SPAD. Under the CMOS readout already exists. We have a uh, uh, functional readout uh, the, the device. And if you look carefully, you see squares. These would be landing sites to be connected for a SPAD. So this is a functional CMOS readout. And on top here, we've hidden 61, uh, we've hidden photodiodes so that the device could be self-testing. Uh, you know, we can test it all. And it works so fine and it's so exciting that this is, although there's literally no sensitive area, this is presently being done and you uh, assembled on the system. So to make proof of concept that we can scale things to large volumes for, in this case, neutron imaging. So the CMOS is ready, the SPADs are functional, 
we have to assemble them. And just, just about the, the, the functionality of the CMOS, and, and this is kind of a, an illustration of how effective it is to look at the digital signal. In blue, the chip that I just show you, showed you actually reproduces a signal from, uh, mimics a signal from a, an analog uh, uh, version of this, this photo detector. So in blue, you see this with some noise and all. The, uh, the, the black dots uh, with balls here is just a system talking to the chip and asking how many photons have you had in the past uh, 200 uh, nanoseconds or something like that. And it, it spits out a, a digital number, one here, two, three, two, one. So it spits out digital numbers like that. And there's yet another mode where we have uh, another signal that, that comes out of the of the the chip in red here. Every time something happens, one photon is detected or one spat is triggered, it sends a flag out. So we can we can use this. It's a very sharp peak, and we can use this to try and time when the photon arrived and do uh, do processing on that. So this is functional. And in the coming year, months and year, we will be uh, ready to assemble the spat array onto the CMOS and, 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 and make it a full system. Um, I'll just take two other minutes to whip by the fact that um, coming back to the experiment. So I talked to you, I told you what we were looking for in these large experiments. I told you photon counting, how we do it differently. Um, now the challenge is, it's a big experiment, and you have to fit it with photo detectors inside the cryogenic. So the experiment was that you might re recall this this whole cryostat here. We're looking at a corner, and on one corner you have a tile here of of those photo detectors. So there there needs to be something like forty thousand, many thousands of uh, tens of thousands. Of, of photo detectors in the system that you have to connect. So that's a complicated feat. You have uh, very few photons, about one photon per five square centimeter. That's a, that's a square inch. Huh? So only when, when an event goes there. So you have to listen to all the, the tank, read it all to get the signal you want. Um, you have to instrument 4.5 square meters of photo detectors with this ridiculous power consumption because it's in a cryogenic environment and you don't want to either boil off or just generate turbulence in the system. So these are crazy numbers and are really complicated to do. But in our system, we think we could probably shave the power consumption down below 10 watt for the whole four square meter just because we're using digital. And using the rest of the allowed power for local processing of, of the information and for communication and things like that. So we're also looking, the fact that we're doing things differently forces us to look at ways how you integrate from the SPAD to a tile. And that's the crazy idea that we have and work, are working on. So these on top, on top of the, the, the top part of the graph is the photo detector here, where you have the SPAD array on top assembled on CMOS. And why only do two layers, right? So that's a device, you can test that, and you can, you can assemble it onto a PCB. But PCBs, for various reasons, are not very good at cryogenics and are dirty. Instead, what we are working on is using silicon as a PCB for the routing and the mechanical structure of the tile and using the other side to do controlling all these and talking to the outside of the experiment, you know, collating the, the, the signals. Uh, power management, these things need power. And communication here, we propose a way to do it with, with, uh, with photonics. So this, so we started from the detector itself, 
But a detector itself, the, the, the photodiode system itself, does a PDC, doesn't, doesn't make a system. Then you have to work to work, uh, towards a system. And that's where we're working, what we're working on. For example, this is a 200 millimeter wafer produced uh, in Berlin at the Fraunhofer Institute. And we have test structures for that interposer on which we would put all our photodiodes. So we're working on this. This gets far from physics, from the physics we do here. But trust me that once you put that in cryogenics, you know, you have to look at all the conventional physics of temperature, uh, coefficients of thermal expansion, aging and things like that of the metallurgy has to be controlled radioactive background and things like that so i'm i'm, I'm concluding on that showing so i showed you the experiments photon counting how we do it differently how we're moving towards the system and uh, in this slide for conclusion i'm maybe i was too emotional when i wrote it you know it sounds a bit you know it's a long path, but it was a fun path though, okay? So let's be positive about that. It's technology development. So you have to be patient. Um, uh, when you're working in a, an industrial foundry, you cannot go in there and do what you want. There is a lot of red tape your process has to go. But the beauty of that is that once the process has been de-red taped, you fabricate 50 wafers and it comes out kind of all the same. We're at the step where we want to validate that it comes out all the same. Uh, we're maturing a process. But the next phase are really interesting, especially regarding Argo experiment, which is not started. It's, it's, an in, it's in its infancy. That's what I wanted to do. You know, it is still very young. It hasn't been designed. And the exciting part is that it will be designed for our detector, using our detectors, um, allowing the strength of our detectors, uh, low noise, high uh, timing precision, that kind of thing, allowing those specifications to drive the way you construct the experiment and go reach the physics goal, that's their, their term, how you count the photons, how you measure the energy, how you discriminate from background, and hopefully, and, and in all that, there's a lot of role for physicists. So that's my recruitment part. I'm looking at the camera here. Anyone want to come with us, come and play? Um, so there's lots of places for physicists where you, you have to go get all your broad knowledge and apply it in places you would have never thought you would, uh, especially in your training. And, and I'm going to skip that, but we are also using our photo detectors for quantum uh, communication with a project with NRC for QKD, which is going very well. That's thanks to, to IQ who supported that work with Waterloo. And we're continuing some work on, on, on medical imaging, developing um, high precision for the timing in that case for time of flight applications. But that could be a, a whole other uh, seminar. So I hope I didn't bore you to death. I hope you thought there was enough physics in there, bachelor level. But uh, thank you for your attention. Okay. So in the nuclear less decay, I didn't see the photons. So when so when you have a, a I'll, I'll take this. So if you have a beta decay, because you, you would also see signals from beta decay. When you have the beta decay, the beta particle is very highly energetic. So it hits. Electro, uh, xenon atoms and they ionize. So there's a shower of ionization there. Um, so it, it, you know, it, either you excite them, uh, well, essentially you always ionize them. Sometimes the ion and the, the electron will form an excited pair and decay uh, luminously. So that's the photon signal. And sometimes because you have a rather strong field, it's a uh, hundred thousand. Uh, volts over a meter and a half that you put. That's another challenge. Um, so the, the pairs separate, the electron and ion separate, and then you will 
measure the electrons on the other side. So here again, it's about, you get for, for the 2.5 mega electron volt, the, the energy you're looking at at that peak, you get about 10,000 photons that reach the detectors. So that's very, very few photons. It, it's a, it's a, when you, there's an event, it's above the noise floor, but, but it's not very high. So the, the issue or the question relates to the fact that some of these devices in parallel, some of these photodiodes could be, uh, could be uh, failing through a, a short circuit. So then you would, you would have a strong power drainage. Well, there, there's the boring answer is that because these de detectors will be there filled and not maintained for 10 years from inter inside, every single thing will be tested. So, so all of the parts will be tested and, and functional, uh, either from the start, you know, or once it's assembled in a tile, the tile will be accepted or rejected, corrected, probably not too complicated, but okay. So that's the boring answer because, but the most interesting answer is that in our case, we have a silicon circuit, uh, a CMOS circuit looking at the photodiode. So if the, the failure is not catastrophic, it's not too strong of a short, um, we can at least forget that spat and not count it at all. Mm -hmm. And that's a main different, major difference on the other side. Whereas here, when aging comes, some of these spads go bad from, let's say, radiation. So for quantum communication, we're looking at applications in space. So space would damage spads and they would go wrong. In our case, we just shut them down. Whereas in their case, the, the noise level always increases with time. So we can, we can really do wonderful things with these digital devices. It's really interesting. Uh, my question is about like, you can detect photons, but then you need to measure energies so that you can distinguish between the different events. So, how do you how do you get the energies of the mm -hmm. particles out of your detections? Yeah, um, so so particle physicists have have uh, been studying xenon and argon as scintillator material uh, for for literally ages. Now even helium is being considered in some experiments. So um, as any scintillator, uh, you have a light yield that is a number of electrons or photon produced by certain energy. So that, that, that also is modeled with more or less precision. So there, there are rules and you calibrate that. So um, when I, I, I don't think I, I brought uh, such a slide, but um, the experiment with, uh, sorry, here, this is not the signal on the center part. This is not the signal you actually get in the experiment. It's much more complicated than that with the uranium, thorium, and all radioactive peaks in there. What we're trying to do is make sure we really understand all the background that falls into the region of interest there. And all the other signals here that you get, I don't know if you see the yellow when I draw. No way. So, um, so, uh, okay, so you get peaks here. All these peaks are actually a wonderful way to know your experiment works because all these are been cataloged in, in radiation, radiative decay uh, for, for also ages. So this is very precisely known. So, so you actually train the system to understand so much the background to single decay events of thorium or whatever, that you know with a very high level of certainty that in the region of interest, you do not have spurious counts. So it's a, it's a, very, it's a rather uh, interesting way. So they, but the short answer is it's calibrated. That's boring, eh? it, it is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Perhaps uh, thank you and uh, thank you to all of you who, who assisted to the talk. And see you. See you again next week. Merci beaucoup. Merci tout le monde. Bye bye. Thank you all.